This episode is sponsored by a personal revolution podcast. Have you been stuck inside wondering how to take charge of your life? Is there something you want to do but haven't been able to do yet? In Personal Revolution, best-selling author and life coach Alison Task helps you take control of your life with inspiration and humor so that you can move from where you are right now to where you want to be and have fun doing it. It's like having a personal coach whispering in your ear. This three-month podcast course along with bonus episodes each month will help you create a clear vision for what you want out of life, remove the frustrating blocks that are holding you back, develop a detailed action plan that will drive you to where you want to be, and build a network that will help you create your future. The Personal Revolution podcast comes with a personal workbook and real-time access to a community of other change makers working toward their goal with positivity, possibility, and momentum. And for a limited time, all of this is available to you for free. Download the Himalaya app in your app store, look up Personal Revolution and enter promo code REVOLUTION at checkout to get your first month absolutely free. If you're ready to go after a better life, you are ready for Personal Revolution. The recommendations of the medical community have been social distancing, makes sense, hand washing, makes sense. Try not to wash, to touch your face uh, more than you have to, especially if you haven't washed your hands. Makes sense. Clean surfaces make sense. So, so the the basics are are there. Those basics I don't think are going to change very radically in the next few days. It, it this this disease has been known now for several months, and these are the basics. So we don't need to subject ourselves to that same information again and again and again and again and again, because that becomes terrifying. The, the good news is, I mean, there's a lot of good news, I think. The good news is that we have, we're aware of the virus. We're aware of how it's spread. We're aware largely of how to protect ourselves from it. Um, we also know that compared to other disease processes that we live with on an ongoing basis, so far, the number of people who have gotten sick is relatively small, and the number of people who have died is relatively small. Welcome to the Gratitude Podcast on www.georgeandbenta.com, where you'll hear a new story each week that will inspire more gratitude in your own life. Our mission is to inspire 100,000 people to discover how to feel gratitude and live a happy life through the amazing life stories of our successful guests and their actionable tips. And now, the host of our podcast, George and Benta. Hi, Gratitude Seeker. Welcome to this special episode of the Gratitude Podcast. We have uh, here with us a, a friend of mine that uh, I got to meet through uh, the Gratitude Podcast. And we connect, connected so beautifully that uh, we kept in touch and um, we, we always love to chat and to, uh, to talk about different things that are, that are important. And um, since we are in the middle of something and he is even more in the middle of something that's, that's going on right now in the world, I thought that it would be a really interesting conversation to have. And the way this this happened <laughs> was very interesting and i think it's it's worth mentioning like i was thinking about getting in touch with him and um inviting him on the podcast to to talk about uh, the coronavirus and the uh, the pandemic and i think it was uh, half an hour or one hour after that uh, his publicist emailed me to ask if I want if I want to do an interview with him, and I thought that was like, wow, amazing, amazing. So it's definitely something that uh, we we are supposed to do somehow, and uh, I think it's 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 a wonderful situation. His name is John Chubak. Uh, he's an MD, a board certified in general surgery and cardiovascular surgery. And uh, he is in New Jersey right now. John, welcome to the Gratitude Podcast once again. Georgian, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to 
be with you and speak with you and, and um, share our thoughts with one another and hopefully help others who are uh, listening. Exactly. So um, let us know a little bit more about your, your background, your ex expertise, so that uh, our audience will get a um, better perspective on uh, who you are and how your, your expertise, your perspective can be helpful for, for our listeners. Well, generally when I do podcast interviews and things like that, it's more related to the side of my career, which is um, focused on personal development and um, being the best that we can be. Um, but uh, recently we've been discussing a little bit about coronavirus because of my medical background. Now, my medical background is, is interesting in the sense that Uh, again, as you mentioned, I'm a board-certified general surgeon and a board-certified cardiovascular and thoracic surgeon, and I trained here in the United States in the northeastern part of the United States. Um, and much of my training was in the inner city environment, and much of my career was in inner city environment. Um, and as a result of all of that, I had the uh, tremendous uh, experience with people with various forms of infectious disease, some of which um, was quite um, serious and, 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 and deadly, quite frankly. So of, of interest is that going back to the beginning of my medical career and my training, I trained in a city Uh, here in the um, northeastern part of the United States, just outside of New York City, called Newark. And Newark, New Jersey, is a um, is a is a big city for New Jersey, and it has a um, inner city uh, kind of demographic where there are a lot of underserved um, areas and. Um, uh, lots of inner city kind of problems. So poverty is an issue, drug abuse is an issue, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> When I was in medical school in the early 1990s, 1991 through 1995, it was just the time that uh, HIV and AIDS really came to the forefront and became a major uh, issue. I believe I was in my second year of medical school when Magic Johnson, the famous basketball player um, from the Los Angeles Little Acres announced that he had HIV and people were devastated by that. So it was a very, very um, scary time at that time. Uh, people did not really understand uh, the HIV virus, They, we were not certain how it could be spread, um, how it could be contracted. Uh, could it be contracted through the air, through coughing, through surfaces, through kissing, through sexual contact, blood? We, we were learning, we didn't know, but we had a huge outbreak of this terrible disease in Newark where I was doing my surgical, uh, my medical school training and then I stayed there for another five years in, in Newark doing my general surgery training. So HIV was a big, a big problem. And um, with HIV came a lot of other infectious disease because the population who developed HIV and AIDS, the immunodeficiency syndrome, were susceptible to other infectious problems, which we hadn't In some cases, we hadn't seen before, really, and in other cases, we hadn't seen in a long time in research. So there was something called PCP pneumonia, which was a kind of pneumonia that AIDS patients got, which could be very, very deadly. And then, of course, we saw a big resurgence of tuberculosis, which had been largely eradicated in the United States because there was good treatment for tuberculosis. So, um, so... That was the very early part of my career. 
and we were inundated with that problem. And then going forward throughout my surgical training in inner cities and Newark and Camden and New York and New Haven, Connecticut and Rochester, New York and big university hospitals. As a general and thoracic surgeon, I saw on a daily basis, many deadly um, infectious disease, including those that were highly resistant to antibiotic treatment or had no treatment. So of course, influenza virus and all of its permutations we saw over all of those years methicillin resistant staph aureus vancomycin resistant enterococcus uh, as i said tuberculosis atypical tuberculosis and the, and of course you know the the list went on and on and on with swine flu and um, west nile virus and so on and so forth so i had a tremendous experience um, with all of these problems so hopefully i have some perspective to share with, with the audience and, and hopefully um, we can find some um, hope in all of that too, of course. Exactly, exactly. That's, that's, that's exactly my point. And uh, I, I love the fact that, that you've mentioned so many experiences that you had with, with similar situations because um, most of us didn't have any kind of experience. Like for us, this is something very new it's something that uh, we haven't seen or or at least it wasn't as personal as uh, as other um, epidemics were this this is like it's spreading all, all over the world and it's it's something that we all focus on and firstly um what i wanted to ask you is how um what was the best way uh, for people to react to this in order for uh, for that epidemic to to move fast to move move faster to uh, to cease from existing like uh, I know that right now uh, there is a lot of panic a lot of uncertainty. What are some things that can can calm us down can bring us more um, certainty more um, calmness? I think we need this a lot and having been through those kinds of situations, maybe you have a larger perspective on maybe just knowing that things are going to be all right and that uh, we can do do things to uh, to make that happen. Yeah, I think that when we get into this kind of subject, it's a very heavy subject. And I think you have to look at it from numerous points of view. One point of view is medical point of view and scientific point of view. But of course, then there's also philosophical, psychological, and spiritual point of view when we look at this kind of very, very heavy subject. This goes back to age-old questions of the human condition and the human mind. Why, why is something like this happening? Why would you know this occur? Why does this have to be uh, the reality of the situation. This is the normal functioning of the human mind is always to want to have answers as to why, what is the cause, what is the purpose, what is the value in this, why, why can't we just go back to the way it used to be, and so on and so forth. Those are all normal thoughts. Those are all normal feelings. So that's the first thing to reassure everyone, that we all have those feelings of uncertainty, questions, anger, um, frustration, fear, anxiety. Now, having said that, that that's normal, then the question is how best to cope with it. And this is where we as human beings, as highly evolved and highly functioning beings, have to try to gather control of our mind and gather control of our thinking. And as you know, in, in my book, which we've discussed in the past, um, Make Your Own Damn Cheese, that in that book, we talk largely about how the mind is structured and why we think the way we do, why we believe what we do, why we behave how we do. 
And so I think it's very valuable in once again going back and studying the mind and to realize that we are not our mind. We are in possession of a mind, just as we are in possession of a hand and we can choose to open and close our hand. If we really understand the mind, we can, we can come to a point where we recognize that we're in possession of our mind and therefore we can little by little, more and more take control of the mind rather than allow the mind to run wildly out of control. Because unfortunately, when we allow the mind to run wildly out of control, most of us have been um, trained and programmed and educated, unfortunately again, to allow the mind to run down a lot of dark alleys and very bleak scenarios and very um, frightening uh, imaginary pathways rather than to be positive. So if we don't take control of the mind, it's very simple for the mind to spin out of control in a very, very terrifying, very pathological, very disturbing, unsettling way. So that's, that's the, the, the first, the first part of it. The second part and again, I, I discuss this component in, in the book, is that largely what we think about is being um, influenced, heavily influenced by the world around us, outside of us. So the news media, the television, the radio, the newspaper, the magazine, the blogs, the text, the memes, you know, everything that we get, I mean, millions and millions of bits of constant information from the outside world is affecting our thinking. So I think one of the very first things that we have to do to sort of take control of this situation for ourselves personally is to say, okay, it's important for me to be informed so that I can be prepared, so that I can behave in the best possible way to protect myself, my family, my friends, my community, my society, and the world. We're all in this together. So I need to be informed, but I have to take control of that situation and say, on the other side of it, I cannot be inundated with negative information or repetitive information, which has little, little or no value other than to terrify me, make me anxious and make me depressed and make me sick. So I have to look at my daily schedule and say, am I going to spend five minutes in the morning catching up with the news on where we stand with coronavirus? Or am I going to sit all day with my laptop or my tablet or my smartphone and the television and watch more and more and more of who died and how many are sick and what's the death count and what's happening in Italy and what happened in New York and what's the story in China and on and on and on. If we choose to subject our mind to 12 hours, 14 hours, 16 hours a day, of continuous bad news into our psyche, you have to expect that you are not going to feel well or cope well with, with a difficult situation. The first thing is, as one of my old mentors used to say, stand guard at the door to your mind. You have to be in control of that gateway to your thinking mind. Enough can come in so that you're informed and knowledgeable and prepared and safe, as safe as you can be. And after you have gotten that amount of information, close the door and move your mind to focus on other much more positive and healthy thoughts and things. That's 
perfect and i think this is this is a great idea to to uh guard guard our um our thoughts and to make sure that we let in those that are relevant and helpful for us but let let us know what what do you think are some um some positive things that we could be doing in, in this period like um maybe i don't know uh, also look into uh, news that are positive that are relevant i know that you you've been sharing a lot of um news that is that are positive right well i think there's a lot of positivity now let's let's begin with the basics of what of what we know the the basics of what we know are actually fairly straightforward so this is one reason why we don't have to inundate ourselves day after day after day from a medical point of view what we know is that there's a new virus okay and i think just about everybody has heard that news there's a new virus i think everybody's heard that um it is you know spreading you know quite rapidly through throughout the world and uh, essentially every country and that it can be spread by coughing or sneezing on somebody what's called micro droplet as many infectious diseases are tuberculosis and influenza and many many diseases are spread that way and it can be spread through <clears throat> contaminated surface once again many many diseases can be spread that same way so so the the recommendations of the medical community have been social distancing makes sense hand washing makes sense try not to wash to touch your face uh, more than you have to especially if you haven't washed your hands makes sense clean surfaces makes sense so so the the basics are are there those basics i don't think are going to change very radically in the next few days it it this this disease has been known now for several months and these are the basics So we don't need to subject ourselves to that same information again and again and again and again and again because that becomes uh terrifying. Now the the good news is, I mean there's a lot of good news I think. The good news is that we have we're aware of the virus, we're aware of how it's spread, we're aware largely of how to protect ourselves from it. Um we also know that compared to other disease processes that we live with on an ongoing basis so far the number of people who have gotten sick is relatively small and the number of people who have died is relatively small so that's a positive thing that's a good thing i mean it's bad that anybody ever gets sick and it's bad that anybody ever dies but as a doctor and as a surgeon you know i've been dealing with the fact that people get sick and die my entire professional career my mother was a nurse my father was a, was a doctor so this is something that we all grow up knowing that people get sick and people die but at this moment just in this moment in time if we compare the influenza virus in the united states to the coronavirus every year tens of thousands of americans die from influenza virus in the united states just in the united states and millions of people get infected 2017-18 was a particularly bad year in the united states there were the the cdc the center for disease control says that in 2017-18 season which was only 2 years ago there were 80,000 deaths in the United States from influenza hmm. okay and this is something that we we deal with if you go to the cdc website you can see that this year they're estimating that there've been so far somewhere between 22,000 and 55,000 deaths in the United States with as many as 50 million people infected in the United States so in comparison the number of infected people that we know so far 
that number will climb, of course, but so far what we know is a small fraction of the number infected with influenza and the number of people who've died around the world is a small fraction of, of the number who've, who've died in the United States from the flu and certainly a small fraction of the number who've died around the world from the flu this year and in other years and every year. The, the concern, of course, is that this will get much, much worse that the mortality rate is going to be higher and that it won't be 50,000 people who die in the United States, it'll be 2 million people. Now, that's a reasonable concern and it's a rational fear, but so far that has not been the case. It hasn't been the case in China. It hasn't been the case in Italy. It hasn't been the case in Spain. It hasn't been the case in the hardest hit areas. Thousands of people have died in those places, several thousand, but not several million. So we have a concern, which is a real concern, medical concern that experts are saying it is possible that it could, it could go to those levels. But the good news is so far it has not. So far it has stayed on the level of several thousand in the worst hit countries, the, the worst affected countries. So again, I think we have to try to live in the now and deal with the facts as they are and react appropriately and try to avoid allowing the mind to go too far horizontally into the future or too far horizontally on the timeline into the past. You'll hear every day in the news, people are talking about the Spanish flu of 1918. Okay, okay, that's something that happened and it's real and it's true. It was 100 years ago. Things have changed in 100 years. Healthcare is different. We have different doctors, different hospitals, different medical equipment, different medications than 100 years ago. So let's not spend too much time dwelling in 1918. I mean, it was an important episode and there are things to learn from it, but we're better to focus our mind in 2020 at this moment. And let's not spend too much time going six months or one year further and counting all of the potential fatalities and infections that haven't occurred yet. Okay, it's important to have some uh, awareness that something very large could happen, but let's not spend our mental time in the worst case scenario when we can choose to live in the moment we're in right now. I think that that's the, a positive a positive thing and a very helpful thing is not to allow ourselves to go too far backward and forward in all of the worst case scenarios of, of mankind and, and infectious disease and much better to stay in the now, in the present moment and try to deal with what we're, what we're dealing with in, in this, in this moment and in, in, in reality. Exactly. And to, to add to that, I'm actually looking at, at the numbers in China that were updated four hours ago and the recovery rate is 90%. Like nine out of 10 people have already recovered. And I think that's, that's something like this is a fact and it's something that's really important for people to know because this is the the coronavirus and 90% of the people have recovered. And also another interesting fact is that out of 1,386,000,000 people, they had 81,000 cases. Correct. That's 59 I mean, cases per million. Again, so many people will then say, well, we can't trust the data coming from the Chinese. They lie about it. They hid it from us and so forth. Now, there may be some truth in that. I don't know that, but assume that it's, it's partially uh, true, that they're downplaying the numbers and so forth. 
we we don't think that the Italian government is is doing that. We think that they are presenting their data as honestly and truthfully as they can. And the last time I checked on that, there were several thousand deaths, 3,000, 4,000 deaths, something like that. Not 30,000, not 300,000, and not 3 million. Now, again, I think in China, if there, if there were hundreds of thousands of deaths that were being hidden, I think the World Health Organization, et cetera, international agencies would probably have some insight into that. Um, so again, I think that as you're pointing out, the number of infections and the number of deaths currently are small compared to other infectious disease processes that we see. And hopefully, we have to be hopeful that this will run its course and we can minimize the amount of infection and death. The, the, Many experts have said that they believe that the that the the survival rate overall is about ninety eight percent. Ninety eight percent is is a great survival rate, but the the problem with that number is they're comparing that to the flu virus, for example, where the survival rate is ninety nine point nine percent. So mm -hmm. it it could be a factor of ten or twenty times more deadly. The question is, are those numbers accurate? And we don't know that yet. We just don't know that yet. We, because relatively few people have been tested for this virus. Most people who are asymptomatic, who have the virus, don't get tested. And most people who have minimal symptoms who have the virus don't get tested. Um, and it has generally been, especially in the early part of, of this outbreak in the United States, it, where testing was limited, there wasn't, there wasn't access to so many tests. Generally, the people who were getting tested were very, very, very sick and were being hospitalized and so on and so forth. So this, the, sample, so the sample of people who was being tested was, was skewed to the sickest of the sick. And then a number of those patients, of course, went on or go on to die and so then that makes the mortality rate look much higher than it may actually be. If, if hundreds of thousands more or millions of more people are infected and never getting tested and having mild or no symptoms, then that will bring the, the mortality rate, the death rate, much, much, much lower and hopefully much closer to what we see with, with the flu, one in a thousand or, or something in that order. But that all remains to be seen yet. That's going to take some time to figure out as testing improves and expands. And of course, I think after this episode has passed, scientists and specialists and you know, epidemiologists and infectious disease specialists and so forth will look back at all of the data and give us a better number. But I think it's important to remain hopeful that um, it won't be as deadly as we have first believed that, again, you don't hope that more people have been infected, but it, only in the sense that if millions of people have been infected and only um, several thousand or 10,000 or uh, on that scale actually die from the disease, then it's not as um, deadly and terrifying as perhaps we, we first thought. But we don't know that yet. We have to wait for all of that information and all of those statistics to come out. It's a, it's a very uh, fluid situation right now, dynamic and developing as day by day. So, so we're going to know more about that, about that later. Definitely. And I'm, I'm really curious in, in your experience, um, in those communities that were hit by epidemics, how, how was the community afterwards? Like, were they able to recover? Uh, what did you see different? Uh, what I'm, um, 
thinking about is how our world will be afterwards. And uh, many of uh, the people in general in the world and possibly some of our listeners have no idea how how we will recover from this because it's it's um it's really having a big influence in, in our lives and i'm really curious on what you've seen what has been your experience with this well i think again mankind uh you know humankind like like most uh every species in in nature in the natural world is um is very resilient and we're actually built for survival we're built for success and we're built for surviving harsh harsh environments um you know if if you look in nature and all of the all of the animals that live in nature um with all of the seasons and the snow and the rain and the ice and the cold and all of the natural phenomenon that go on it's it's a very very difficult environment generally speaking but nature has evolved in such a way as a very darwinian concept is you know adaptation and survival of the fittest so we we are built we have evolved and we have survived to survive to be to be strong and capable and resistant and resilient and so when you look at the history of mankind not only from infectious disease but from every um difficult uh chapter of the book of history mankind comes through it mankind came through the bubonic plague uh we came through the the um the uh, viral illness the the flu spanish flu of 1918 that they call it many people died many people got sick but mankind human the human race went forward and only continued to improve the world is is better now with more sanitation and more clean water and more um medical care and and access to hospitals and doctors and nurses and so forth in 2020 than it was in 1918 we we had the, again this terrible outbreak of hiv when i was in school and hiv continues to be a problem around the world but in the beginning it was terrifying now it's something that we've learned to accept as part of our reality we try to protect ourselves through uh safe sex practices that were highly educated around the world medical practitioners became more aware of um exposure to blood and different body secretions in terms of gloves and masks and face masks and so forth so we learned from those things and we got better and we got through it together um think about all the war that has plagued the 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 earth and how many how many dictators have come and gone and how many deaths in the, in the millions and millions have been lost on the bat- battlefields of of this planet uh probably mostly senselessly but the human being rises up and pulls together and um continues on and uh it's not always easy it's um it's not always easy but but we like all the other animals on this planet have a have an intrinsic desire to live and to survive and to grow and to uh procreate and um i believe that this situation will be no different that at the at the end of this this um difficult period um mankind will still be here and and going strong and doing well and recover um and uh and the reality is georgian that after that down the road of life there'll be the next thing the next thing that we have to cope with this won't be the last you know um sort of gray chapter in the history of of uh, our species there are there are other things to come um and that's that's the reality of life and we're 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 all you know built 
to handle that and cope with it and um, and go forward. Definitely, and I think it's it's very important how we uh, how we react now and how we see things now because this will help us um, be even stronger for for possible things that um, that might happen in the future and having this faith and this this gratitude for this these things that for the fact that we are built this way and that we find solutions and we somehow uh, bounce back and get even better as as humans i i think that's that's something amazing and um i think it it's really something that we can be grateful for I agree. You know, on that su- on that subject, being the gratitude podcast, I did have a couple of ideas I thought I would share with you. You know, I think it's so beautiful what you do sharing this message of gratitude. But Thank you. gratitude, I think, is not just a mental process of awareness that I'm grateful for my parents. I'm grateful for my family. I'm grateful for my health, etc. That's that's a very important part of it. But what, the, before coming on your program, I was thinking to myself, there's also the idea of showing gratitude and the act of gratitude. And so why is that important right now? One of the things that we believe about this current virus is that generally speaking, there are exceptions obviously to every rule, but generally speaking, this has been a more deadly and more serious disease for the elderly and for people who have other illnesses, underlying sicknesses, um, whether that's immunodeficiency or diabetes or emphysema, smokers, um, et cetera. But people who have other underlying diseases are more susceptible and people who are elderly are more susceptible to having a severe or deadly um, infection. Now, why is that important? It's important, I think, because one of the areas where we've been sort of struggling is in getting other people, in many cases, especially young people, who are otherwise healthy to participate in this global effort for what's being called social distancing. Because the young people are hearing in the media and and otherwise healthy people are hearing in the media that generally speaking, they're not going to die from this. So since they're not going to die from it, um, they can feel more um, emboldened or more confident in getting together with friends and partying and um, socially interacting and so on and so forth. But if those people love the other people, if they love their parents, if they love their grandparents, if they love their friends who are, who are not well, who may have a cancer that they've been dealing with for some period of time or some other illness that they've been dealing with for, for some period of time, If those people who are young and healthy are really grateful for those other people they have in their lives that I just mentioned, then they they need to show their gratitude. They need to show their gratitude by how they act. They have to act grateful by observing the recommendations of the medical professionals, which is to avoid excessive social interaction, practice social distancing, practice um, uh, voluntary quarantine, even if you're not feeling unwell, because this is how you're going to protect the most vulnerable in your, in your family, your community, your society, and again, the world. So this is, this is an important thing that we have to remember, I think, going forward in your, in your program, which I love so much, is Gratitude is not just the state of mind, but it's also how you behave and how you act and, and how those actions and behaviors are going to impact someone other than yourself. 
Exactly. Um, we are going to, um, so if you could get back on in, uh, in about a, a minute, uh, for some reason it's, it's stopping at 40 minutes and, okay, sure. uh, to, to get back <clears throat> in the meantime, um, do you have any other ideas that you would like to share? Um, yes, I think that, um, one thing you touched on is the idea that hard times, difficult times, challenging times like we're going through right now, in a way, is an opportunity to bring the best out of the nature of human beings. And I think we're seeing that around the world. I think we're seeing governments share information. I think we're seeing people um, show solidarity for one another, average citizens within their own communities and within um, uh, different countries. Everyone is participating in this process to um, beat this, this infectious problem and, and minimize its impact on humanity by, by doing the right thing and coming together and behaving in the right ways. And I think that that's a very, very beautiful and optimistic sign and it's it's one of the good things that that comes out of hard times that we really do rally um as a species and show our best colors in these difficult times yeah we we are basically united yes like we never been before absolutely we are nearing the end of our time together and i wanted to ask you if you have um, a certain message that you would love our listeners to to think about at the end of this interview, something that uh, they can ponder, something that uh, will remain with them at um, you would like people to remain with at the end of uh, this interview yeah, I think that what i'd like to share is that um, we're we're living in a in a difficult time and I think that everything um, will, in the end, turn out to be uh, good because we are sharing knowledge and we are mobilizing all of the best that humanity has to offer in terms of science, technology, um, the people um, on the ground, our governments, etc. I think everybody is working together to see this difficult time come to an end as quickly as possible and with the least illness and the least um, tragedy possible. And that I just ask everybody to be aware, to be informed, but make an effort not to overwhelm yourself with repetitive negative imagery and information on a continuous daily basis, because this, this leads to a very, very um, pathological state of mind and can only lead to uh, unhappiness and anxiety. So try to follow all the rules that are being um, offered by our health professionals in terms of hand washing, sanitation, social distancing, and spend as much time with your your close family members in a quality way, turn off the television for the vast majority of the day, have discussions again, sit down at the dinner table and eat together again, play board games again, uh, do some reading again, slow things down, appreciate this beautiful life that we've all been blessed with. And if you're feeling well, um, be grateful for feeling well um, at this moment. If you're not feeling well, reach out for uh, medical help and uh, God willing, you're going to recover. Your chances of recovering in most cases are extremely excellent. And just try to stay on the positive side of things. And um, with time, like all other things, like all difficult periods of human history, this period will also pass and come to a close and um, things will normalize. Thank you so much for, for this beautiful message and for all of the amazing things that you've shared with us today. 
Thank you. Thank you, George. And it's been my pleasure as always. Hey, Gratitude Seeker. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this interview. I really appreciate it. And if you could think of one person that would also benefit from it, share it with them. It might actually be the inspiration that they need to make their day or maybe even their life much better. Thank you so much once again. This has been Georgian Benta. Don't forget to keep seeking and spreading gratitude.